there and welcome to the Secrets of Organ Playing podcast. I'm your host, Vidas Pinkavichus. Today's guest is Jeremy David Tarrant, an internationally acclaimed concert organist and church musician from Detroit, Michigan. In performances that are consistently hailed as elegant, communicative, and powerfully artistic, Mr. Tarrant is increasingly recognized as one of the finest organists of his generation. Since 2000, Jeremy has served as organist and choir master of the Cathedral Church of St. Paul, uh, where in addition to playing for liturgies and concerts, he conducts the famed cathedral choirs. Prior to this appointment, he served as the cathedral's assistant organist joining the staff in 1994. In April of 2007, he was seated as canon presenter of the cathedral in thanksgiving and recognition of his role in the liturgical and musical life of the cathedral community. He is the founding director of the Cathedral Squire School of Metropolitan Detroit. A student uh, of the American organist and pedagogue Robert Glasgow, Jeremy David Tarrant is a graduate uh, of the University of Michigan School of Music, where he earned the Bachelor and Master of Music degrees in organ performance and sacred music. His other instructors include Betty R. Pursley, uh, Corliss Arnold, and James Kibbe. He has had additional coaching with Lynn Davis. The recipient of numerous awards and honors, he was awarded first prize in the Otombo National Organ Competition in 1997 and second prize in the Arthur Poister National Competition in 1998. Mr. Tarrant uh, has also been a finalist in the American Guild of Organists regional competitions. Jeremy is in frequent demand as a teacher and clinician and frequently serves on the faculties of the Royal School of Church Music summer courses as well as the American Guild of Organists summer pipe organ encounters. An active concert organist, Jeremy has performed widely in North America in such venues as the Washington National Cathedral, St. Thomas Church, Fifth Avenue, St. James Cathedral, Toronto, St. Patrick's uh, Cathedral, New York, and Chicago's famed Fourth Presbyterian Church. He frequently appears with the Detroit Chamber Winds and Strings and has performed in regional conventions of the American Guild of Organists. In 2008, Mr. Tarrant made his European solo debut with a recital in the Cathedral de Saint-Étienne in Meur, France. Uh, And in 2011, he played the closing recital of International Organ Week in Dijon, France. In 2012, he was a featured organist in the Pine Mountain Music Festival, presenting three solo recitals in Michigan's Upper Peninsula. In July 2014, Jeremy conducted the Cathedral Choir during the tour of England, where they were in residency at Chichester Cathedral. This tour also included concerts and services in Canterbury and Southport Cathedrals. In this conversation, we talk about his experience with organ registration, playing large instruments, working with choirs, the importance of playing the piano, and working on air training for organists. Let's go to the show. So, Jeremy, I'm so delighted we're finally having this conversation uh, because uh, uh, you are such a terrific uh, uh, virtuoso on the organ and you will have many, many uh, stories from your concert tours to share today. Uh, Thank you so much for your time and welcome to the show. Thank you very much. I'm pleased pleased to be here today. Let's start with with the obvious question I always ask uh, our guests. Uh, uh, Do you know uh, uh, the story of your early childhood? Uh, Who was the person which uh, uh, introduced you to the organ? Maybe do you know the the situation? Uh, Could you share the story? How did you first fall in love with the organ? Well, there is music on both sides of my family. My my uh, my mother's side of the family is is Welsh, and so there's a lot of singing, of course, <laughs> in that side of the family. But my my father's mother um, played the organ in her church. She was not a trained organist. She sort of had to learn herself. And um, 
so I had some exposure to the organ that way. Um, and of course, I think at that time in, in one's childhood, you know, you're seven, eight, nine years old. Uh, I think that people, that, that children are, are attracted to the physical aspect of playing the organ. You know, children like to push things and uh, maneuver buttons and, and things like that. Um, so I think there was a little bit of that for me too. But uh, my grandparents, uh, particularly my mother's parents, uh, took me to organ recitals. Um, and uh, I think that's really how I fell in love with it. But, but really, my, my family also attended a church that had great music. Um, first-rate church music, both choral and and the organ, and that re- that's really when I when I became enraptured with the organ as well. Fantastic! So someone really in your family was responsible for this for this lifelong pursuit, right? Lifelong uh, passion for uh, for the organ. And uh, when we think about that, uh, um, it's so important, right? This early age, uh, early, um, early, these years. Uh, and if we can have someone uh, from uh, adult world uh, come up to us and uh, and say, "Here, this is the great instrument," and uh, maybe you want to take a look at this inside, right, of the pipe work or the bellows, I, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, hopefully, this young person will be inspired for a long time. Yes, you know, and and also, I mean, going back to the the church with which we were involved, um, there were many people there that knew I was interested in the organ and knew I was studying the organ. I was I was taking lessons with the uh, with the organist of our church, and um, and they were very uh, uh, supportive of me. So it was a, there was a lot of support both at home and at church, um, and in my community uh, for, for for what I was doing. Uh, and uh, besides music, did you have any other, you know, interests like like uh, sports or other, you know, regular <laughs> regular life in uh, in, in uh, interests that, that so to say normal people have? Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> uh, I, there there really were not sports involved. Uh, there are are some pretty tragic stories of of me uh, and involving in sports, uh, but. <laughs> but um, <laughs> so I didn't do any of that at school or anything like that. Um, it was mainly around uh, in in childhood and, and early adolescence. It was it mainly focused around uh, the choir. I was very involved mm-hmm. in the choral program at our school, which was very very good. Um, and that's really really what I did. Um, I I always had an interest in history. Um, I was uh, you know biography. Um, historical documentaries things like that um i really enjoyed that um movies old movies oh yeah you're right classic films, uh, was a great pa- it still is a great passion of mine and uh so i um yeah so, but but uh but that yeah that was about it I, there were really no sports involved mm-hmm. uh for, <laughs> probably thankfully for everyone else but uh, uh you know it's very interesting uh, uh, th- when you come uh, to the organ for the first time, usually people f- uh, s- uh, f- feel this grandeur, right, magnificence yes. in this instrument. Did you feel this way too, or uh, something else uh, was uh, most maybe mystery of it? Uh, why did you became so fascinated by, by with the organ? I, I think it's difficult to say. I mean, I, I think there's there's many things the 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 magnificence of the sound and of course we have to be very careful of that with young students because it's very easy to make um a very grandiose sound right away without knowing uh, how or why you're doing it and uh but but it but it's great fun of course to explore the organ um i think the um you know the services in our church were very beautiful and i think that um that part of it uh and and the organ's role in that um, was was very uh, um, uh, inspiring to me. Um, you know, we we spoke before about the sort of physical aspect of playing the organ when you're that young. Um, but I I was captured by the sound. Uh, we had um, as I, as I said before, I went to a church with very very good music. Uh, the organist was first rate, is first rate, um, and. Um, so I also heard a lot of good repertoire right away, mm-hmm. and um, uh, 
so, so I think it was, I think it was the, the whole, this is sort of an alchemy, you know, really, of all those things. Right, it's it's like a like a, uh, the the love from first sight, right? Uh, you don't right. know why you do. It's a chemistry, right? You yes, don't know yes exactly. When you can't put it into words, that's that's the best way to to explain. Yeah, you never. Yes. If you can't explain why you love a person, it's not really a love, then, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, probably. I, you know, I was just, it was just captivated by all of those all of those things. Sort of like Vidor talks about uh, being captivated by that mystic. Uh, wave of sound of the Kavayakul organ uh, that was so um, uh, inspirational to him. You know, you touched uh, Vidor, and Vidor is French, and I know you have a great fondness of French organ music. Do you know <laughs> when um, when did that came about? I think that came about very early because um, I had um, some recordings, and the French repertoire was what um, I had access to on recordings. Um, it, some, we were talking about this the other day, about recordings uh, that you had as a child or you know in your growing up years. And I had the first one I remember um, was the English organist Roger Fisher at um, uh, Chester Cathedral. There was a, a, a LP, mm -hmm. uh, uh, 33 and a third. And uh, I remember particularly from that um, uh, disc, the Saint Sans uh, E flat Fantasy and the Roger Ducasse Pastoral. Oh yeah, yeah. And in fact, I, I just found Roger Fisher on Facebook. I think it's the same Roger Fisher. And I, I wrote to him and I said and I was telling him how inspirational that recording was when I was you know eleven, twelve years old. Um, I had a lot of um, cassette recordings of Marie Clarelin um, playing Bach. But the, I also had two recordings by Lynn Davis, uh, both at Chart Cathedral. Um, the the one that I remember particularly was a um, a recording of music of uh, Maurice Duraflet and Jean Alain. Mm -hmm. And so I heard that music really early on, and, and something just it, it just resonated with me. Um, I still refer to that recording as a benchmark for me in some of those performances. Um, so uh, and and uh, both the organist in my church and and then later my teacher Carlos Arnold uh, played a lot of that music, um, and I and I think just that that's that's what I was drawn to just from a very early age, mm -hmm. because of those fantastic recordings, of course. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Jeremy, um, what do you remember the first organ piece that you actually played, learned, or mastered? Um. Well, I, I fortunately my 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 first teacher Betty Persley um, was an excellent teacher for me because um, I, I remember uh, we went. She was the organist of our church, and we went to a recital that she was giving. Uh, I went with my grandparents and my my mom, and we spoke to her afterward about lessons for me. Uh, and so I, I, we met with her one day, and she had me play an audition at the piano. Um, and I think she, maybe she did some ear tests and things like that. Um, and immediately finding that I was rather deficient in piano, you know, she set about a, a course for me, and um, you know, with a, another piano teacher. So I was having piano lessons and, and organ lessons at the same time. And um, she said, you know, look, you, if you're going to do this, you're going to do it right. And so she, I, I, I'm so grateful that I had that kind of um, structure right from the beginning. So it was literally page one, you know, with the Gleason method. And when we mastered page one, we went to page two. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and so I, there were a lot of little pieces in that book that I played. But I remember the first sort of... Um, piece uh, where I was away from that book <laughs> were uh, some of the Brahms chorale preludes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, sh uh, Betty Persley also uh, took me through several of the 79 chorales of Marcel Dupre. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember the, the F major prelude and fugue from the Little Eight. Uh -huh. I, I remember that being a, 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 I sort of felt that was a rite of passage. I, mm -hmm, <laughs> But th so that's probably the first uh, quote unquote legitimate organ piece maybe I, that I re remember. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, you probably didn't start with Bach right away, right? With those uh, Orgelbuchlein chorales? No, yeah. not right away. Mm -hmm. No. Um, uh, you know, again, 
I, I had some remedial work to do. But also, uh, you know, one of the things I appreciated about Betty personally is we, we got to touch at the organ right away and how, how this technique differed from playing the piano. Mm-hmm. Um, she wanted to instill that right away. And I'm, again, I'm so glad that I had someone with the, that, that provided that kind of structure. Um, no, not the Olga Buchheim right away. In fact, I, I think I was doing a lot of those uh, chorale preludes of, of Dupre before I got to Olga mm-hmm, Buchheim. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Of course, uh, Dupre 79 chorales were mm-hmm. written specifically in mind uh, as, as being a sort of uh, a prerequisite for, for Olga Buchheim, right? Chorales. Yes, yes, mm-hmm. absolutely. Mm-hmm. So fantastic! So, so from your first organ teacher, you 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 learned so many great things about the technique, right, and how it's different from the piano. And by the way, uh, what kind of piano background did you have at that time? Did, could you play, let's say, Chopin, or uh, no, no, not Liszt? at all. Mm-hmm. I, I no, <laughs> um, actually, I had uh, I had taken piano as a child from about the time I was uh, maybe eight. Um, and I, you know, I was always interested in the piano, but, um, I don't think I ever thought of it as a, um, as a career or anything like that. Um, I, I, and I was definitely not, um, you know, supremely gifted. (laughs) So really, uh, it wasn't until I, I started the organ that I, um, uh, really paid more attention to the piano. Mm -hmm. Um. And also, my piano teacher w- was an organist, a, a, a very good organist. And so, um, my, some of my piano training was was aimed at preparing me for the organ. So I did a lot of, you know, the Bach two and three part inventions the, from Praise and Fuse from the Well Tempered Clavier, um, some of the classical sonatas, some sonatas of Haydn, um, some uh, of the easier Chopin. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, re- I think there was some Debussy in there, maybe like the Sunken Cathedral or something like that. Uh, but um, but I did not uh, get into um, a, a lot of a lot of repertoire beyond that uh, until I got to college, and then I I, I had continued piano uh, I think until I was a sophomore mm-hmm. in college, and uh, when I could get to some of the um, I oh I loved the uh, the the Schumann Kindersehnen. Mm-hmm. Uh, I got to some of the Brahms and Dermetzi, uh, music that I still love, and music that I wish I would have spent more time with then. Ah, uh-huh, you know? great! But, uh, but no, I I was uh, when I when I got to Betty Persley, my first organ teacher. I had a lot of work to do. Uh huh. Oh. Do, yeah. Right, and you of course notice that piano technique really does help uh, for the organ. I think that it's absolutely necessary. I mean, I I just. Uh, you, you know, I, I, I kind of wonder sometimes about organ teachers who don't put any emphasis on um, a piano background, and I, I just don't see how you can get around it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Especially uh, if you're interested in the later organ repertoire, right? 19th century, yes. 20th century. Yes, yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, and uh, when did you, uh, when the idea crossed your mind that the organ could be your career path? Right away or not right away? Later? I think right away, actually. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, because, you know, I, I liked uh, what was going on in my church. I, I wanted to do just that. I wanted to do what my teacher was doing. And basically, I just decided that that's what it would be, and I never looked back. Um, I, don't think I, I don't think I thought twice about it. I, in fact, I don't think I really thought about it at all. I, I thought, well, this is just... Um, I just assumed that's what I would do. And uh, I look back, and that was quite a blessing, actually, because um, um, it was hard for me to identify with uh, um, other friends my age who didn't quite know what they wanted to do, you know. Um, But I I knew, and um, that, you know, I I had, in in that way, I kind of had it easy because I I knew exactly what I wanted to do, and uh, I I went after it Mm -hmm. as best I could. And uh, Jeremy, let me ask you this kind of weird question. Sure. <laughs> uh, imagine you had a, another life, another opportunity, right? Would you choose organ se- the second time? Uh, I, yes, I, I think I would, um, in spite of all of the enormous challenges, <laughs> in spite of the very hard life that organists have. Right. 
Um, I think I would still choose it. Uh, I'm, I'm pleased to say that I would still, I wouldn't have it any other way. The regrets are worth it, right? Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Um, although the, the life as an organist is not... Uh, uh, the easiest one and it's it's um it requires lots and lots of dedication which you mm. uh, of course uh, have uh, but uh, the results and the s satisfaction it gives right to you and you give to people when you play right it's yes, worth yes. it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. fantastic Absolutely. so what happened later in college uh, uh, how did your uh, uh, playing changed uh, from what you learned uh, with your first teacher betty Uh, well, when I got um, so I, I did my undergraduate work at the University of Michigan in the studio of James Kibbe. Mm -hmm. um, I um, and I remember being very excited getting there, um, but you know I had been a very big fish in a small pond at home, and all of a sudden I was with these very gifted uh, other students. When I entered James Kibbe's studio, I was the only undergraduate in that studio for I think two years. Um, there were lots of lots of doctoral students and master's candidates uh, preparing their exams and recitals. And uh, so I learned a lot from them, actually. I uh, heard a lot of repertoire that I had never heard of before. Um, with James Kibbe, I explored more of the Orgerbüchlein right away. Um, I was introduced to some elements of articulation that um, I hadn't previously known. He was very helpful uh, to me, especially with that. Um, I, I was having a good time. It was difficult. Mm -hmm, it mm -hmm. was more difficult than I thought it was going to be. Uh, but, but, um, but yeah, I, um, uh, you know, I got, I got to Michigan, was, was hearing a lot of things. The, the University of Michigan has, um, and still has a very good, um, fall organ conference. Mm -hmm. And so we were hearing, um, the great masters, uh, you know, um, uh, I remember that first, um, That first uh, year at Michigan, uh, we heard Marie Madeleine de Riflet in her last uh, tour of the U.S. Um, and uh, later on, uh, Marie Claire Alain. Um, uh, also, also the Michigan faculty themselves, uh, and James Kibbe and Robert Glasgow. Um, uh, we did not. I, I, when I was at Michigan, Marilyn Mason was not playing as many concerts. Mm -hmm. Um, at least at home, and so it wasn't actually until much later in my time there that I heard her in concert. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, did you notice uh, spectacularly high heels of those French organists, lady French organists? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yes, I, I do remember uh, Madame Durifle, these these gold high heels. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that was a particular. You know, I had always I, I had um, I had the Durifles, that famous uh, recording of theirs from the the National Sh Basilica. Mm -hmm. um, in um, Washington, D.C. And uh, so uh, to finally hear her and meet her was 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 a, a great highlight, you know, of that first year. Um, and I remember she walked very slowly onto the stage. Uh, you know, she was she was still, uh, you know, even after that was uh, 18 to 20 years after their their terrible accident. Right. And uh, she moved very slowly, of course. But the minute that she got on the bench, I mean, it, it all of that disappeared, and it was just electrifying, absolutely uh -huh. electrifying. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, you, you know this famous uh, Zilberman sh style organ that U, U of M has in, in one of oh, the yes. recital halls. Was this in place already or, or not yet? Oh, yes, that was already in place. Um, it had been, I think that organ is from 1985. Uh-huh. And I got to the University of Michigan uh, in 92, 93. Mm -hmm. um, and um, um, so, uh, yeah, my, I had a lot of lessons on that, um, particularly um, that first semester. I think my lessons were mostly on that organ. Uh, we had studio class there a long time, part, partly because there were a lot of, of the doctoral students were preparing their, um, their doctoral programs uh, Uh, on that organ, mm -hmm. so so we were there a lot. Yeah, mm -hmm. there was another interesting organ in town in Ann Arbor, uh, First Congregational Church. You know that early style organ. Oh yes. the that Carl was, Wilhelm. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. Did you play and that? We, yes, I played that a few times. Um, there were. Uh, I I don't remember if it was 
the university or if it was uh, the Ann Arbor chapter of the American Guild of Organists would organize um, Friday recitals in Lent, mm -hmm. and they often asked the students to play. And so um, I, I played that um, uh, several times. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, the Hill that. Auditorium. Was that organ in reno re under re re renovation when you were a student or not? I think, uh, well, it was sort of always undergoing some uh -huh. sort of work. <laughs> um, but uh, I think when I first got to Michigan, they were still dealing with some water damage uh, to the solo division. Mm -hmm. um, and so so that first semester at Michigan, uh, we were not in Hill Auditorium a lot. Uh, um, but the, And that changed uh, later on. But I, I, I do remember I, the first lesson or first opportunity I had to, to practice there um, – was overwhelming you know I had not encountered an organ this large or with this these kinds of voices and so um, I, I remember that very distinctly again I remember going over to the key office at the University of Michigan to get my key to Hill Auditorium which organists could have and um, just feeling you know on cloud nine about go <laughs> going and playing this for the first time mm -hmm. uh, and, and and what was the challenging part of that of, of wielding this great beast if you can can say that, well, gosh, I, yeah. I mean, I just had not had experience with an organ that large before, and uh, learning about the various tonal resources. Um, also, in Hill Auditorium, one has to um, uh, is, is sort of creating the the chorus or the ensemble is a is a challenge there. Um, so there was a lot to learn about about that. Mm -hmm. And of but course, I, I loved. This. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. I, I loved the um, some of the solo sounds, uh, things like the heckle phones. Uh -huh. and there's a, some a lovely bassoon, bassoon uh, at sixteen, eight, and four in the in the choir. Um, some of the strings, you know, I, I was captivated by some of those things. Yeah, right. There is one church in Ann Arbor, uh, First Presbyterian Church, I guess. Yes. which has mm -hmm. um, a Schoenstein organ, I think, and it has yeah. a very powerful. Um, a read called uh, Ophiclide, right? Uh, I think so, yeah. yeah mm -hmm. it, and uh, s some of my friends called it Awful Clyde. Very, yeah. very, very loud. You know. <laughs> it's so, sort of unfortunate. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, but it's only uh, too loud for the organist, of course, because out in the room, in, yes. the, in the church, it's okay. So uh, when you play those big organs, uh, Jeremy, um, uh, how do you, how do you deal with uh, with the problem or the issue of registering a piece w in comparison uh, uh, with the small instrument, for example? Mm -hmm. How do you adjust? Uh, well, because I mean, I, I uh, let me say uh, just a quick uh, uh, th sentence or two. Because of course, uh, when you play the big instrument, you uh, when you uh, draw out one flute or two or three. Mm -hmm. Nothing happens, right? You have to to use more ensembles like that, right? Think? Yeah, and Hill Auditorium is an example of that, where you have to register in a great number of stops sometimes, mm -hmm. uh, or or use a combination of stops to to create the effect of a uh, one voice that uh, where you might have only one stop on on another instrument. Um, I think that, you know, I always, with registration, I always remember what Robert Glasgow would always say to us, uh, that all is fair in love, war, and registration. So, uh, really, it's uh, any port in a storm, and you go after the effect in, in any way you, you can you can manage it. Mm -hmm. If that means playing on the two foot down two octaves, go ahead, you know. Right. <laughs> um, of course, sometimes you can you can you can overly complicate the situation, too, especially if you're away for a recital, you, you run out of time, you know. Um, but um, but I I mean it's it's a part of playing the organ that I that I really love you know that all that experimenting um, with what will work and sometimes it's it's the uh, sometimes that you you achieve the effect in very unorthodox ways mm -hmm. and of course each organ is different right and that's what we love about yes. it right mm -hmm. uh, to uh, to adjust and to uh, to make uh, all those color possibilities so different and do you notice that when you you go to travel to some different country and you have an ideal sound of a particular organ piece let's mm -hmm. say uh, the toccata by Verne that uh, you so so fantastically play uh, on that uh, in, uh, i've seen a video on uh, the oh. diapasons uh, webpage you know oh, okay. and uh, imagine 
imagine you have this uh, piece, for example, and you go to another country, and yes, you know the specification and the style, but when you, you sit down to play, it's something really different. What do you do then? Yeah, and, and it's not just with the registration, but sometimes with the tempo and the touch, mm -hmm. you know, because the room is, the room is of course, the, the, the most important stop in the organ. Um, yeah, there's a lot of adjustments to be made. You know, it's it's one of the great challenges, uh, perhaps the greatest challenge of, of going from one instrument to another, um, but I also find it to be one of the more interesting parts of, of playing. And um, so, you know, yeah, it can be very frustrating at the same time it's... Uh, it's very, um, it's very uh, challenging and exciting in a way, you know. Right, it's uh, challenging when when you have a limited amount of time, right? Uh, maybe right. Yeah. two two hours before the recital, but if you have, <laughs> um, I don't know. Um, sort of uh, leisurely way of exploring the sounds of the organ and you have an extra couple of hours to, ad to, to adjust, right, to, to mm -hmm. experiment, then it, the experiment uh, and the, your experience becomes sort of very pleasurable and uh, uh, I would say uh, maybe very happy and relaxing, right? Yes, and you know, one of the things that helps a great deal, I, I mean, I try to... Um, when, I, when I'm going to an, an instrument with which I'm not familiar, um, I try to hear the organ in the room uh, in various combinations. Um, it's sort of striking to me, you know, we have, we're, we're fortunate to have many guest organists here at the cathedral where I work in Detroit. And um, uh, it's, it's interesting to me, um, not a lot of people ask to hear the organ in the room before they begin registering their recital. Now, I th some of that probably has to do with, with time, but you can learn so much and you can learn what not to do <laughs> if you spend some time, uh, if you have the luxury of having someone play the different sounds to you in the room. Um, and, and I probably don't do that enough either, uh, but it, it's, 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 uh, it, cannot, it's, it can be a time saver too. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, to to uh, to have somebody do that for you, but of course you're a, you're an, a principal organist there, and you know ins and outs of this organ, right? And uh, you kind of yes. <laughs> you can you can imagine how it sounds out in the room, probably with by, your by eyes closed. Time, yeah, by this time I can. Of course, when I'm working on maybe a new piece or registering a piece differently, even on my organ, um, I can always ask my my associate to listen. Uh, I have the luxury of that kind of help or a friend, um, because even though I have been at this organ for virtually all of my career, uh, um, I, there are still things you discover about it. Mm -hmm. You know, an organ, your, your, your ears change uh, as you mature, um, and the, the, uh, so the organ sort of changes uh, for you. Um, and I, I like finding different registrations, new possibilities for pieces I've played, you know, uh, since I was a child, uh, but in, and even on the same organ, um, I think it's a it's great fun to be able to do that. Do you find changing your registrations by hand or by feet, you know, with pistons, a little bit of a challenge? Yes, I I, um, I mean when I'm at a new instrument, I I I practice those changes as much as possible. I mean I I like to get the recital registered right away. Mm -hmm. Um, so that I can begin practicing those those uh, piston changes, um, I am I very much like the layout of the instrument in my church with the pistons. It's very convenient, um, and so sometimes when you go to an instrument where you don't have all the, those luxuries, uh, you have to practice a lot. I was uh, I played a recital recently on the, there's a marvelous uh, organ by E. M. Skinner here in Detroit at the Jefferson Avenue Presbyterian Church. And um, I was fortunate to play a recital there last March. Um, the organ, I think, I, I, I think it's some, like six general pistons or something. And there's, it's, it's, the, it's all very it's, original, so uh, there's, not a, there's not the uh, multi-memory um, uh, capability. So uh, I had to plan my registrations very carefully and economically. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, I spent a lot of time doing that and practicing those um because uh i just I'm, I'm not used to that i have you know we have 20 general pistons and all memory levels um i think it's easy for organists of of of, of our generation to and, and younger to to be so uh, uh we don't know those tricks you know of yesteryear about 
the e- economics of registration, you know. Uh, but I, I'm for the possibilities. Anyway, you know? Right. And it's so fun, right, to, to, to do this homework at, uh, beforehand and to plan those very carefully economic changes uh, strategically, yes. right? Did it work, by yes. the way, your homework? Your, I'm sorry. Did it work, your, your planning, uh, uh, or was it different when you, uh, in reality, tried it out? Oh, no, it was great fun. Um, I had a generous amount of practice time there, so mm-hmm. um, it, it was really, really great fun, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I wish I could do more of that, because I, I, think, I, I think I was more thoughtful um, in planning my registrations, not just the changes, but the registrations themselves, um, you know, because I had to be so careful. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was thinking about that, uh, an- another thing that Vidor said, v- Vidor did not like kaleidoscopic uh, registration changes. And, and I, f- I think he said, no magic lantern effects, please. <laughs> and um, and I, was, I was thinking about that when you have limited um, uh, capability with the combinations. Um, but um, no, I had great fun and it, um, I mean, it, it was challenging, but uh, I think it all worked out in the end, I think. You know what's fascinating about organ music and having uh, limited abilities to change stops is that uh, in many cases, mm, organ piece itself is so spectacular and and very well built that uh, even if you don't have a lot of places to change pistons and change registrations, it still works, don't you think? Yeah, I I think sometimes um, we... um, I, I think sometimes that that organists get preoccupied with um, the registration, making making changes where I- instead of listening to the texture and where where the, the, where the, uh, the different ranges, you know, um, sometimes we forget to let let the music and let the organ work together for themselves. You know, mm-hmm. um, I, I think oftentimes we're very quick to try to manipulate it, um, and if we just listen a little more at the beginning. You know, um, maybe we don't don't need all of that. Mm. Uh, sometimes that does not mean that I'm not um, absolutely captivated by people who can ha- can make these incredible um, uh, registration changes where you don't even notice it. That I mean, there's there's so many organists that use the organ so well um, that make you know dozens of changes uh, here and there. But um, but but sometimes you know it it is good to sort of get back to basics and and just mm-hmm. listen a little more. Exactly, and uh, in in your Saint Paul's Cathedral in Detroit, uh, what else do you do besides uh, playing recitals and managing concert seri- series there? Well, I'm the organist and choir master of the cathedral. Um, I'm also the canon presenter, which means that I have some special responsibilities in planning the liturgies in cooperation with the dean. Um, so it's a it's a big job. <laughs> uh, so actually, um, uh, there is so much of my time is devoted to the choir. We also have an extracurricular choir school for the the boy and girl treble choristers. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's a lot of my time that's that's uh, spent in the choir training and, and, and preparing the choir for various things. Um, that's really the bulk of my work, you know. Um, but we also, I, I'm, I also have the opportunity to do a lot of playing, um, and uh, the the cathedral clergy are very supportive of, of my um, my of concerts and 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 my playing. Mm-hmm. Um, we I we also have a. Uh, um, a wonderful associate organist Charles Miller, um, who is also who also um, is the director of the Philip Truckenbrock Concert Artists. That's the other part of his job. Uh, so, um, yeah, I, I would say that that there and, and of course there is administration mm-hmm. involved. Mm-hmm. Um, so one has to be very careful and and protective of one's practice time. Um, and I'm I'm still not. I, I think after all these years, I'm still finding a way to organize it all. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, um, but yeah, it's uh, there are many facets. To the and job. of course, uh, we have to mention that uh, the choir of men and boys is, of course, very old, right? It's now it was founded more than 120 years ago. Well, yes. Um, so when I first came to the cathedral uh, in 1994 as the assistant organist. Um, the program really was only the choir of men and boys. Uh-huh. Um, later, it became 
became necessary for us um, to, and, and we added, uh, when I became uh, organist and choir master, um, we added a component uh, for, for girls and women. Um, but it became necessary for us, um, and it was the right decision for us, to mix the boy and girl trebles. So now we have what is called the cathedral choir, um, and that is um, uh, the, the, the soprano section is, is sung by the, the boy and girl treble choristers, and the altos, tenors, and basses are, we have some staff singers, some, some paid singers, and some volunteers. Uh, we have some very skilled volunteers, which is, which is nice. Um, and they sing some of the services. Uh, then we have the cathedral singers, which is just the adults. Uh, and we then have uh, the Scola Cantorum, which is uh, a sort of more uh, smaller chamber group, which is comprised of the staff singers as well as uh, some of the volunteer adults who just wish to give that extra time. Um, so it's sort of three groups in one, mm -hmm. um, and they, they share the services, and that way we're able to cover a lot of repertoire a lot of from, from all periods, and um, it works out rather nicely for us, yeah. And of course, uh, it probably I suspect your cathedral is faithful f uh, to the in uh, Anglican tradition, great Anglican tradition, traditional music, right? And you can explore yeah. all sorts of styles and variety of repertoire. Yes, I, I would say that while the while our choral repertoire is pretty firmly rooted in that English cathedral tradition, it's decidedly more broad than that, mm -hmm. um, and um, so. Um, and, I, and I'm glad for that. I mean, I, I think it's I think it's more representative, and um, and so we enjoy you know music of of all all periods and schools. And uh, do your choristers, right, the choir members, um, um, appreciate your organ playing as well, or only conducting? Do they go, go uh. to your to your uh, recitals, for example? Uh, oh yeah, some of them do. Um, I think that some of the the treble choristers maybe take it for granted. I don't know. Um, when they're present, I'm not doing a lot of the playing. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and at the at the prelude time and at the postlude time, they're already in another part of the building, so they don't always see uh, me doing a lot of that. They see more of that uh, on the part of my of, of my associate. Um, uh, but. But yes, there's a, there's enormous uh, support in the choir for that, um, and sometimes I'll I'll be getting a new piece ready or something, and I'll ask them to stay after so I could try it out, you know. <laughs> uh, and yeah. of course, if they they can really sense that they have a privilege to have this world class uh, virtuoso in their midst, right? Oh, <laughs> oh yes, they're very they're very uh, they're very kind and very interested um, in it. Um, Uh, absolutely. And how about how about do, did you have uh, some experience says uh, when uh, young people come to you and say, "Oh, oh Master Jeremy, can you uh, demonstrate a little bit uh, your great organ? Can you show me the bellows or the pipe work?" You know. Well, we we actually um, about once a year we try, especially with new choristers, we uh, try to have a, a tour of the organ, mm -hmm. as it were. Um, so that they can learn. Uh, I'm always, we, we did this with a, with a small group of, of um, choristers who are entering in the fall. We have these sort of summer prep sessions for them on Wednesdays. And last week um, I did, I did this sort of tour of the organ uh, with them. It's a little difficult in the cathedral because I can't take them into the instrument, just the way that you get into it. Um, but I'm always fascinated, particularly the ones who have never heard a pipe organ before or maybe have seen one and heard one but really can't say anything about it, I'm fascinated by their questions, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, how it works. Um, and um, so, and I give them, you know, I take them to the console, and sometimes they'll have a little piano piece, and I'll say, well, play what you do at the piano, and they, they experiment with the stops mm -hmm, and that. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's a really important um, opportunity to give one's choristers. Mm -hmm. so that's how somebody else introduced you to the organ, right? You, it's it's exactly. exact exact situation, right? Yeah, yeah yes, yeah. We have we have to ma make those opportunities mm -hmm. available. Mm -hmm. You know, unfortunately, I, I, there are still I think those churches that keep the organ under such lock and key yeah. that uh, it's it's impossible for anyone to. Uh, to uh, to explore with it but with a little guidance i mean there's no harm in at all in in, in letting ch particularly children um 
mm-hmm. you know, gain a gain an appreciation through actually being able to touch the instrument and play the instrument. And you mentioned the questions that the <coughs> that they ask. <coughs> Uh, I'm sorry. And uh, 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 can you always answer their questions, or uh, sometimes they are so so terribly yeah. difficult? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sometimes sometimes they're terribly difficult questions, and you have to sort of sort of uh, uh, uncover what they're really asking mm-hmm. uh, uh, t- before you can before you can comment. Yeah. And of course, their eyes. Can you see the 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 glimmer in their eyes? This this curiosity this innate child's curiosity which hasn't been extinguished because they haven't been adults yet right, <laughs> turned right. Into adults so right. hopefully uh, because of your enthusiasm and passion for the organ you can transfer a little bit of love uh, of to uh, to their hearts as well and maybe that will uh, be a little bit of spark to them too later on right you know it, it here at the cathedral it's not possible for them to see the the player mm-hmm. um which is a little bit unfortunate um i mean i prefer that a- anonymity in the, in the in the service um but it's a little bit unfortunate for them because they don't they, they can hear all this happening but again you know as i was saying you know when when i was young i wanted to be able to see all that and, right uh, right now i don't really care to see any of it but <laughs> but um but i wish there were a way for them to to see it a little more for a lot of our organ recitals here we try to have um a camera mm-hmm. and screen available to the audience. Um, uh, we can't always do that, and we're, we're right now we're trying to f- find a better way to to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, space is an issue around the console, and so uh, we can't always get a, the camera where we need it. But um, we we but we do try with that, and I I know the audience does appreciate that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, I've heard that uh, whenever you have this visual aspect, whenever organ is in front of the audience, or if you have mm-hmm. a screen and uh, televised production of the recital, it's so much. The impact is so much greater. Yeah, you know, I I, I was thinking about that um, a couple of years ago. I, uh, someone had pointed it out to me. I I used, I used to say, oh, I don't know why we have to go through all this. I don't. I you know, it's a lot of trouble to set all this up and. And uh, but it was really because I didn't really care mm. to see it. But but you know somebody pointed pointed it out to me. He said you know Jeremy, you go to the the orchestra hall and you hear and you hear a piano concerto and you, you want to be able to see the the performer. Um, it, it you know we have that connection to the performers in the concert hall. But oftentimes in the church, you know the organist is so remote mm-hmm. um, and and off on on their own. Um, so no, I I understand and um, I understand and I appreciate that that need to have that connection to the the performer maybe a little more than I used to. Right. Uh, and we as organists sometimes take it for granted because we know what's happening, right? We, we know what the organist does. And, uh, yes. And sometimes we have to uh, try to get into people's mind how they feel, right? About the mystery yeah. and if they don't see something, they, mm-hmm. they are turned off p- perhaps sometimes at least for a second. And that's when you can lose them. Right. I think I think with, w- when we create the opportunity for them to um, see the performer, even if it's just you know uh, through uh, through a camera, um, we're enhancing that experience for them a little more. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, Jeremy, uh, uh, what are your plans now? What are you f- working on right now in organ playing? Oh gosh. Uh, well. <laughs> um, I uh, in October uh, coming up in October I'm going to St. Louis mm-hmm. uh, to make a recording uh, my first uh, solo CD um, uh, on a, a newish uh, Casa Matt organ in the Kirkwood Presbyterian Church um, that's in the last uh, week in October and I'll be I'm I'm recording the seventh symphony of Vidor um, which has always been uh, one that I've I've liked a great deal. Um, it's a very challenging piece. Um, I've played it for a little while. I've, I learned it in 2009, and I finally feel ready to maybe record it. Mm-hmm. Um, there have not been many recordings of that piece. Mm-hmm. Um, but on that recording also is supposed to be the mystique of Vidor, the middle movement of the Trois Nouvelles Pièces, mm-hmm. what he wrote very close to the end of his life. Um, and and then the rest of it will be um, some of the fantasy pieces of Vierne. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So really, the rest of the summer, and I, I have some some concerts next season, um, and so getting ready for those. Um, it's uh, you know it's it's about you know there's always this, this challenge in organizing 
my time and um which you know everybody has uh, and uh, uh, so while I have some time the choir is still in recess uh, until September 1st so I'm trying to make hay while the sun shines as it were right. and get so much of that preparation out of the way and of course the challenges but, go ahead the, the recording, uh, I'm sorry the, but the recording is basically the the, the, the closest project on the horizon mm -hmm. <laughs> right. And of course, I was saying that uh, the challenges that you encounter now are so different uh, from your early years, right? Can you compare those? Uh, yes. Well, I mean, I, I, it, it all has to do with our, um, with our experience and our, our, our changing, our, our ears change and, right. and everything about us. Um, um, yeah, I mean, I think I, I think one is always growing. I, I you know, I, I, I speak about this with the choristers um, now and then about how, um, you know, we're, we're they're sitting there, you know, thirty weeks into the choral season, and you know, another rehearsal, another service, another even song for them to sing, and I um, I, I sometimes have to remind them that you know this. Um, Music is always changing for us. It's never finite, uh, and uh, all there's no there's no final concept of of any work of art. And so, um, you know, the the um, the ability to to be constantly honing it and 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 refining refining yeah, um, is is a great gift actually. Mm -hmm. And uh, so yeah, I mean, I I listened, you know, uh, a couple of years ago, I found a cassette recording of the very first organ recital I played, the very first solo recital I played, which was in high school. And um, I, I listened to it with, I, I, I forgot that it existed. And I, I listened to it and I thought, gosh, that was, you know, that was pretty good. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, but it took me back, you know, I think when you're, um, you know, 15, 16, 17 years old, um, you're untainted in a way. I mean, you, you know, your, your, your eyes are, are still big and you have all this excitement. Um, now you know there are a lot of challenges and, and you understand the challenges a little bit better um things actually become maybe some things become a little more difficult for you um um i said to robert glasgow my my teacher my in graduate school um i said it seems to me that i i, I feel i feel sometimes like i'm getting worse you know, as I as I go on, and he said, "No, your your ears are growing, and you're you're more critical. You're more right. self-critical." Mm -hmm. And he said, "Don't don't uh, don't take that as a bad thing. Look at it as 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 that you are growing, mm -hmm. that, you're, that you're doing more listening." Right. And I think really um, one thing that Robert Glasgow did do for me um, was he really got me to listen to what I was doing. Fantastic. I think I I didn't have I didn't pay as much attention to um, to to listening to my own playing um, that I did when I got to him. Too many mm -hmm. young people really play the organ loud and fast, right, without any idea of how it sounds and how it sounds in the room and how the listeners perceive it, right? And if you have mm -hmm. a uh, situation when, when a professor or an, an experienced organist can tell you, uh, you know, you're playing this piece a little bit too fast or too choppy or too, too something, right? Uh, listen, b better listen. Like, like y y your professor Robert Glasgow said to you, then it's it's really um, I think uh, changes the in entire performance because your listeners will perceive that you are listening too, don't you think? Right, right. You know, I um he said to me one time um I, I can't remember the the piece I was doing uh, but I, I remember it whatever it was it was very um it was very virtuosic and and he said you know you have a great facility and you you, you can play it this fast but why are you playing it <laughs> this fast and of course you know some of that has to do with youth mm -hmm. um um and uh and when i began to listen a little bit more um i also i also uh, began to discover how difficult it is to slow things down mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. um but yeah, it's sort of uh, again. Vidor talks about this. You know, speed is the folly of youth. Uh -huh, uh, uh -huh. You know. And if you uh, play, if you play uh, bon Le Banquet Celeste by Messiaen, for example, it's one oh, of yes. the most challenging pieces ever written, yes. probably, because <laughs> it's, it's extremely slow. Yeah, you know, I, 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 I th it's funny you mention that piece because I, I. 
played that on this recital in high school that I was telling you about. Uh -huh. I found the recording. And um, and I remembered that then. I could never play it slow enough. Right, right. My teacher. Um, and uh, I remember having to take the smallest note value and do the t t t t in my tongue to, to keep myself, mm -hmm. you know. Um, mm -hmm. And I think it, Messiaen, I think the first printing of that piece had different note values, mm -hmm. and he, he halved the note values in another one because nobody could play it slow enough for, mm -hmm. his, for his day. So, yeah, yeah, it's challenging. Yeah. yeah, it's very challenging. Um, and uh, we, we can probably even calculate how good the performer is uh, by the length of, the, of, of his performance, her performance of this particular piece. The longer, the better. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right, exactly. It's I mean, about uh, seven minutes, right? Or six minutes long. Yeah, so something, like, something like that, yeah. yeah. Another play, like four minutes, because it's only two pages, right? Right. <laughs> so, exactly. So fantastic. Uh, and Jeremy, of course, um, I'm conscious of your time. You were ch sharing so great ideas about registration, about your your experiences with big organs and your your experiences with choirs. And um, before we close this conversation, can you uh, s tell us one thing that you wish you knew when you first started playing organ? Wow. Yeah, that is a difficult one um, because I try not to think of them in terms of carrying around regrets. Right. <laughs> but, um, well, you know, you, we, we were talking about this the other day on Facebook, and I, I said, could you send me some of the things that you want to ask <laughs> just so that I could be thinking about them? And that was the one that I got stuck on uh, about, you know, what what did I wish I would know? I actually uh, think that it really – I we go back to the piano mm -hmm. in a way um, – and say that I wish that um, I, if I had it to do over again, um, I would spend a lot more time with the piano. Mm -hmm. um, I did continue the piano into the first part of college, and and you know when I when I went to college, I didn't do, I didn't go right away to the University of Michigan. I, I went to Western Michigan University. The University of Michigan was a great big department, and it scared me off for a while. I mean, I I, I just didn't have enough confidence in myself, so I did that very early part. Uh, just for a year um, at the University of Mich at, at Western Michigan University, and I had a, a, a piano teacher who had a lot of confidence in me, mm -hmm. uh, Phyllis Rappaport, and um, she really helped me a great deal, and actually got me very interested in a lot more of the piano repertoire. Um, I couldn't play it all yet; um, I was inching toward that. Um, I did continue piano when I got to Michigan. I had a wonderful teacher. Um, uh, again, I began to explore a little more repertoire, but I was getting so busy. Um, by that time, I was the assistant organist at the cathedral, and there were a lot of accompaniments and things uh, to always be churning out. Um, and I, I think I minimized the importance of continuing the piano. I, I would have done it all the way through. Mm -hmm. And now my 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 regimen of practicing begins with the piano, with some technical exercises uh, even today, because just you know, for limbering up and 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 keeping keeping that, um, but I, yes, I, so I think the I, I would have spent more time with the piano. Um, I think also that um, I don't think we do enough in music education in this country um, in developing the ear uh, through uh, through solfege and and psy singing. Um, I fortunately had a lot of that because. Uh, it was expected in the choir, mm -hmm. um, but um, but I think that's something that needs to have more attention earlier on. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the European uh, mo the, the European system uh, is much better at that um, mm -hmm. because the the sight singing and solfege from childhood. I mean, mm -hmm. it's not something that started later. It started right away, mm -hmm. and in conjunction with with whatever instrument. And I think that. Um, we need to look at that a little more closely in our in our American system. Fantastic, Jeremy. Thank you so much for your insights. I I think people uh, will get so much inspiration from from your 
um, ideas because uh, yes piano playing has to be taken seriously right right away uh, for the organist and air training as well right away f whenever you can uh, even if you're an, an amateur uh, musician right uh, uh, loving the instrument uh, without any uh, aspiration to become a professional but if you want ever to understand what what the music is all about and to hear right. better what you're playing probably uh, right. air training is a good place also to I, I also think that the the, the organist uh, needs to spend a lot of time listening to music that is not the organ mm -hmm. um, I love to go to the the symphony um, and chamber music and all of that um, and we have uh, we have a wonderful orchestra here in Detroit, um, so I go very often. Um, I, I just learn so much from getting away from the organ. Um, you know, organists are, are solitary by nature. Um, it, it's, it's the circumstance of our instrument. You know, sometimes we're up in a loft, away from <laughs> from other people even. Um, but I think that there is so much to be gained in in um, uh, listening to to chamber music to um, the, the symphony, um, I, you know, I, I think that I used to compartmentalize all of my music making a little more. This, you know, here was my here was my life as an as an organist. Here is my life as a choir trainer, and so on. Um, and uh, I've I'm a lot happier now that I don't try to compartmentalize those things because at the end of the day, it really is just all music, mm -hmm. and it all works together. And um, so I think we should we should. We should celebrate that a little bit more. Um, uh, it's it's really important, yeah. Absolutely. So, Jeremy, can you give us a link where people can find you and your, your work online? Uh, well, you can learn about the cathedral, the Cathedral Church of St. Paul here in Detroit, by going to DetroitCathedral.org. That's our website. Um, I do have some... Um, uh, I don't have my own website yet. There's one under construction. I'm 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 late to the dance and all of that actually. <laughs> it's only recently that I've uh, begun to pay more attention to it. Um, but also there are some I do have some performances on YouTube mm -hmm. and I think the channel is Jeremy David Tarrant. Um, there are some performances of Vierne and Fleury and I think Litez um, on there. Um, uh, some recent uh, videos of some of the pièces de fantaisie of. Vierne that I enjoyed doing, and my friend uh, Aaron Tan, who is also a marvelous musician, did the um, the video, uh, the audio and video portions of that, and so you can see uh, parts of the cathedral in it too, uh, where I work, and so um, so those are are there too. I think I think the channel is Jeremy David Tarrant. Yeah. Fantastic! I will uh, include those links uh, uh, into the description of this conversation. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate that. So great. Have a fantastic, creative, and brave year ahead of you. And um, you. keep in good health, Jeremy. And Thank I you. It's we'll, we'll stay in touch. We will. Thank you so much. Take care. If you liked this conversation, I encourage you to visit my blog, Secrets of Organ Playing, at organduo.lt where you will find lots of insights, practical advice, and training for every area of organ playing. You can subscribe to this blog for free to get your daily dose of inspiration and to be the first to know when any of my future podcasts roll out. I hope to help you reach your dreams in organ playing. I'm Vida Spinkavitus. Thanks for listening, and I'll catch you online really soon.